Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 2. The Dawn of Man. I suppose it's necessary to mention that this episode is rated E for evolution. For some people, it's still a touchy topic, and I can somewhat understand why. No major religion I'm aware of, ancient or modern, has ever veered from the belief that God, or the gods, created mankind. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church has no problem with evolution, but it's under the pretense that evolution is being directed by a heavenly helping hand. But I get it. You know, having an Englishman with a big white beard come out and say we're the descendants of apes is a pretty hard fact to swallow. I mean, have you seen the new Planet of the Apes movie? Clearly humans and apes are not the same, and therefore are mortal enemies, whom we must battle for the survival of our species. Well, maybe except Dr. Zaius. I love you, Dr. Zaius. Wait, what am I talking about again? Oh, right, evolution. Alright, here's the deal. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Everything that I'm going to be talking about in this episode is backed up with cold, hard evidence. Fossils, artifacts, bones, tools, carbon dating, middens, which are these giant ancient garbage piles. You name it, it's there, and it's fact. It's also a fact that mankind never existed alongside dinosaurs. We also did not descend from monkeys. Ever. Yes, some distant proto-primate ancestor was probably monkey-alike, but our genetic ancestors are apes. Still, it would be so awesome to have a monkey tail, I mean, when you really think about it. So, here we are in Africa, about four million years ago. Picture a vast, lush jungle continent that gives way to the open flat ground of the veldt. The continent is inhabited by a massive diversity of plant and animal life, and a very different Sahara Desert as we know it today. As in, there isn't one. Now, since about 15 million years ago, various primates had survived remarkably well by living in the treetops, safe from most predators. Except at some point around that 4 million year mark, descendants of these primates climbed down from the trees to explore the African savanna, on two legs. I should point out here that many books I've read mention this pivotal moment in humanity's evolution as using the phrase, chose to come down from the trees, strangely implying that our distant ancestors grappled with the decision to start walking on two legs. Maybe a whole group of them did it at once, or maybe it took some ape rabble-rouser to get the rest to go along. Like, guys, here's the crazy thought. How do you feel about an upright position on the ground? I know we've got peace and comfort in the trees, and most of the things down below want to eat us, but look, when you stand up, you have hands. Isn't that neat? I've always felt this was a cop-out answer, because anthropologists simply had no better way to explain why this happened. Except, thankfully, if you wait long enough, someone's bound to do some new research into solutions, and the latest explanation why these apes left the trees? Climate change. Not the man-made global warming as we know it today, caused by greenhouse gases trapped in the atmosphere. I'm talking about the natural function of the Earth to go through periods of gradual temperature changes. Towards the mid to late Miocene epoch, the Earth begins a cooling period, which caused some pretty significant impacts to life as we know it. Aside from mass extinctions, the trees in South and East Africa, which had adapted to a hot and humid tropical environment, could no longer survive as well in this new drier environment. As a result, the jungle thinned out, and our ape ancestors found it harder to survive in a sparse treetop. The solution? Be bold and take to the ground. I suppose then if you want to argue, mankind did have a choice. Our ancestors could have stayed in the treetops, perhaps evolution favoring those with tails to reach distant branches, or longer toes and fingers, or some other neat function. But throughout man's history, it seems that as a species we always go for the riskier, slightly more dangerous path. Are we nuts? Oh yeah, definitely. But this fearless streak is what makes our species so adaptable, and therefore one of the most resilient on Earth. The first hominids to come down from the trees are the Australopithecines, Australis being Latin for southern and Pithecos, Greek for ape. Yes, it's one word with two different languages. The genus Australopithecus holds the honor of being the progenitor of our species, though there are different hominids within the genus such as the tiny Australopithecus africanus to the larger afarensis, of which the famous Lucy skeleton was a member of. These early hominids walked comfortably on two legs, in part to evolutionary changes in the feet and the butt. You might not realize it, but our derriere is the secret to a bipedal lifestyle. It allows for a sustained upright posture without tiring, the ability to sit down without lying down. Look at your pets for an example. 
And, I kid you not, this prevents pregnant women from tipping over. See, there aren't many truly bipedal animals in the world. Birds don't count because their legs aren't the primary mode of transportation. I'm thinking more like a kangaroo. That baby joey they've got in the pouch gets pretty big. But then there's that massive tail they've got for balance. Well, we don't get an awesome tail, but our gluteus maximus keeps it all in check. That combined with the curvature of the lower spine allows pregnant women to compensate for the shift in their center of gravity. And now you know. Another advantage to walking upright is that instead of basically having two sets of feet, your hands are now free. At first, I'm sure the Australopiths had no idea what to do with them, but again, they caught on fast. Walking around the plains of Africa all exposed offers little to no defense against predators. It's not like we've got razor-sharp retractable claws or massive quills that stick out of our back. For these early hominids, the only option when in danger was to run up a tree. But since those trees are few and far between now, the Australopiths discovered that their hands could grab rocks and sticks and then throw them, or hold onto them and use them to bash things you don't like. Oh, there's so many choices. The Australopiths continued adapting to their new environment until about 2 million years ago, when a series of genetic mutations progressed enough that there were now two completely different species. One was the genus Paranthropus, who were big and mostly vegetarian, with skulls similar to gorillas. And the other one? Cue the fanfare music, because the first species of the genus Homo has arrived. Since the late 70s, it was a known fact in the scientific community that Homo habilis was our first direct ancestor. However, back in 2010, the anthropologist Darren Kerno of the University of New South Wales published his findings on hominid fossils found decades ago in South Africa. These had been attributed to habilis, but were in fact a new, older species he called Homo gautengensis. This was all achieved using new DNA analysis and better research methods than we had 40 years ago. So congratulations, Homo gautengensis. I guess this makes you our greatest of great-grandparents. But not much is known about them yet, so we'll be sticking to the previous champion, Homo habilis. Right off the bat, what's surprising about them is that habilis wasn't that big, standing at about 4 foot 3 inches. The real distinguishing factor here, and their secret weapon, is that the habilis brain was larger than the australopith. With more thinking power, Homo habilis could really start understanding their world on a deeper level, like noticing how when rocks break, sometimes they form these sharp edges. And there are some rocks that do that better than others, and they're also really good for slicing up meat. Habilis learned to make crude cutting tools, using them mostly for scavenging kills from other large predators and bringing back to their homes. Or possibly not. So while there have been discoveries of a large concentration of stone flakes and animal bones found near Habilis fossils, the verdict is still out on whether early hominids like Habilis had a centralized social structure to accomplish all this. Now also of note is that this is the first time members of our genus start to actively pursue meat in their diet. The other two hominids in Africa, Australopithecus and Paranthropus, were quite content with their vegetarian diet, occasionally snacking on bugs and small critters. Habilis, on the other hand, really enjoyed that sun-baked gazelle. So why did this happen? I got one word for you. Necessity. In a world of fewer trees and vegetation, you either cling to your old ways or try something new. Habilis was the consummate opportunist. Go after whatever you can. Eggs, insects, lizards, and carrion, of course, but also active hunting. Now, they'd most likely stick to going after young or small animals, but also the sick, the injured, or old. Baboons and chimpanzees will also do it occasionally to supplement their typically vegetarian diets. So Homo habilis went after meat because it was available, but also because they discovered they really liked it. Now aside from taste and preference, is there anything on a biological level to explain this dietary shift? Well, my vegan friends, you might want to cover your ears for this part. Meat is more easily digested than tough plant matter, and is more nutritionally dense, in that you get more bang for your buck. What do I mean by this? Okay, consider the mighty and magnificent gorilla, a distant relative of ours that's stuck with the veggie diet and therefore needs to spend most of its day eating plants in order to sustain its enormous caloric requirements. 
A vegetarian diet hasn't physically diminished the size of the gorilla, of course. After all, an average silverback male is about six times as strong as a fit human. But since they are almost completely entwined to an immobile food source, they are not well adapted to change. As conservationist and gorilla expert George Schaller put it, the very existence of the gorilla, free from want and free from problems, is mentally an evolutionary dead end. Gorillas can easily defend themselves against the fiercest predators Africa has to offer, but they're unable to react against the most dangerous predator in the world, us. Check out the documentary Virunga for a stark example of it, but make sure you got a box of tissues nearby. Back to our ancestors, Homo habilis is chomping away at antelope tartar, and just like that, their body is loaded up with protein and fat and vitamins and nutrients in a far quicker and more efficient way than if they had just spent all day eating leaves and bark. Since Homo habilis doesn't have to expend that caloric energy on digesting cellulose and other plant matter, they've got a lot of free time on their hands now. A leisurely lifestyle leads to social and technological developments, of which we'll see later. This behavioral change also brings a slow physical change as well, as humanity's ancestors start developing smaller canine teeth through the ages. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? You'd think that if you want to tear through a tough steak, you'd want big old saber teeth. But again, let's go back to the gorilla. They have huge incisors, which they use to tear through tough skin plants and fruits. Us? Well, when was the last time you picked up a watermelon and bit right through it? We use tools to effortlessly slice through rinds and skins and whatever natural packaging our food comes in. And this tendency of ours to depend on technology for survival comes from a taste for meat. Scientists believe that the greater influx of animal-based protein was a critical factor in the development of the human brain. Our species doesn't need fangs because we can just think up new and inventive ways to catch, cook, and eat the meat that sustains us. Ah yes, meat. It's what brains crave. Now over to my carnivorous friends, this doesn't mean if you consume your own weight in chicken nuggets you'll get smarter. Clogged arteries are a more likely scenario, because the modern sedentary lifestyle stands in contrast to the active one of our ancestors. Evolution occurs over long stretches of time, and while our bodies may have adapted to a diet rich in lean natural protein, at this rate, we're probably adapting towards something like the people in Wally. Hmm. I'd actually like a cupcake in a cup now that I think about it. Anyway, enough about diet. Let's talk about some important dates on the old timeline. Roughly 1.5 million years ago, another hominid appears. Homo ergaster, working man. This species improved on the tool-making techniques of habilis and is also believed to have been able to produce sounds. That is, to have a voice. No doubt this was limited to very basic communication, maybe a certain low-pitched grunt for a rock, or a particular screech for a big cat or something, and so on. Ergaster appears to have developed from Habilis, but may have lived alongside our next ancestor for a few hundred thousand years before vanishing from the fossil record. That next ancestor would be the great Homo erectus, of course, upright man. Erectus appears on the world stage about 1.8 million years ago, amidst a bit of confusion as to its origins. One theory is that they also developed from Homo habilis, or even Homo ergaster, and then spread out from Africa to Europe, Asia, and Indonesia, all places where Homo erectus fossils have been discovered. Or conversely, they evolved in Asia and migrated to Africa. This theory is based on a site in Dimanisi, a town in the country of Georgia which has hominid fossils dating from 1.8 million years ago. But then again, some scientists think it's an altogether new species of man called Homo georgicus, and then some others just think the whole thing is a carefully orchestrated hoax by the Illuminati to increase museum attendance. Uh, maybe. Whatever. I'm no anthropologist, so I'm sticking with the first theory because I can. So let's talk Homo erectus, the next in our family tree. A physically imposing specimen, standing tall at almost 5 foot 10 inches, with a thick skull, large brain, and big muscles. The bone structure of their skull, even as anthropologists thinking they may have spoken actual words too, not just sounds. Again, nothing too complex, but enough to communicate deeper thoughts like, this rock knife needs sharpening, or don't eat that food, it's gone bad, and hey, what are you up to Friday night? Homo erectus also marks the start of mankind losing much of their body hair. 
There are a lot of theories out there as to why this happened, ranging from a natural form of parasite repellent to even a human aquatic evolutionary phase, but the one that makes the most sense to me is that less hair means staying cooler in the African sun. A big ol' fur suit is pretty uncomfortable for running around on the savanna, and since depilatory cream won't be invented for a while, it makes sense. This could also be about the time mankind developed sweat glands, which while stinky, work really well at staying cool. Well, in the right climate at least. Anyone who spent time during a humid New England summer knows what I'm talking about. I should also point out that the loss of body hair brought new problems as well. More skin is now exposed to sunlight, which means UV rays, and therefore an increased risk of skin cancer. Natural selection favored those hominids with darker skin, which acted as a natural sunblock. Although, hang on, you say, not everyone has dark skin. So what happened? Well, that's a story for another episode. Actually, the next episode. So save all your pigmentation questions for then. Homo erectus is all set to be the latest and greatest of the great apes so far. They've got the genetics, the intelligence, and the drive. But what happens to our other hominid cousins? Insofar as the fossil record tells, while Homo erectus lived on Earth, both the Australopiths and the Paranthropuses disappear from history, between 800,000 years ago and 1 million years ago. We can try and attribute this to further climate change, spoiler alert, there is that whole Ice Age thing, and really they were an evolutionary dead end, but it's also completely within the realm of possibility that Homo erectus played a role in their downfall. Our direct ancestor was a crafty thing, and I'm willing to entertain the notion that in a bid for dominance, they either wiped out the other hominids or reduced their numbers so badly that there was no way the species could recover. Oh, but there's no way a primitive species that's practically a wild animal could conceive of genocide, some of you might be thinking. But perhaps consider this little fact. In 1981, at Olergesali in Kenya, Scientists uncovered the grisly remains of a prehistoric massacre. Almost 90 baboon skeletons were found close together, males, females, and children, with their skulls smashed and bodies broken. Telltale cut marks found in the bones, combined with specific stone axes found around the vicinity of the site, all seem to point to Homo erectus as the culprit here. What exactly happened? Was this a coordinated raid against a dangerous enemy and potential rival? Was it a ritual for some unknown religious purpose? Or maybe it was just the garbage heap where they tossed the remains of those mouth-watering baboons. <sniffs> Regrettably, we'll never know the real answer. But what is known is that these prehistoric baboons are not like our modern variant. This baboon was a giant of muscle and sinew, capable of weighing almost 150 pounds, a solid skull, huge incisors. This animal is designed to reign at the top of the food chain, and Homo erectus easily took them down. If our ancestor could do this to a bunch of hyper-strong monkeys, well, then imagine what they could do to our far less threatening cousins. Next time, we continue on with our crazy smart, slightly homicidal ancestors, Homo erectus. Africa's nice and all, but many are getting the itch to travel around the world. Europe's the first stop, although Homo erectus would be arriving right smack dab in the middle of the Quaternary Glaciation, the fancy talk for the Big Ice Age. Well, that's okay, we've got our nice and warm body hair to keep us all nuts. Well, how will our brave and fearless relatives survive the cold? What's to protect them from saber-toothed tigers? Can man survive on mammoth carpaccio alone? Mmm, I'm gonna say it all works out. Or not. It's suspenseful stuff on the podcast history of our world.